I've often heard it said that Christians worship three gods while Judaism is inherently monotheistic, therefore the conversation just kind of ends. But is it true that Christians worship three gods and Judaism is monotheistic? No, we don't worship three gods. Okay. Uh, we worship one God, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The concept of, you know, we've mentioned, I think, before, Echad, God is a unity, and he's made up of, of, of those three persons, which in Christianity we refer to as the Trinity. We realize that the word Trinity is not in the Bible itself. It's a concept. It's, it's a mystery. We can't really understand it, but we believe in one God. We believe in the Jewish God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So why is it oftentimes asserted that Christians worship three gods? Well, because we say God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, right? So once you say God and the Son of God or God the Son, it sounds like these are three different gods. And what we would say is they're three persons in one Godhead. So that's the idea. It's not that there are individual gods. It's that God manifests himself. He is in three persons. He's not just showing himself to be as one and then another. There are three coexistent, co-eternal persons yeah. of the one Godhead. And David, what about the monotheism of uh, Judaism? The idea there, and it's even said by specifically Rambam, who wants to say that it shouldn't say Echad, but it should say Yachid. But it doesn't say Yachid, it says Echad. And so this is a, it's an incredibly interesting thing. Whatever we want to call it, the issue that we have to deal with is we see it in the text. Mm -hmm. The verse that comes to mind is Isaiah 48, verse 16. It says this, come near to me, listen to this. From the first, I have not spoken in secret. From the time it took place, I was there. And now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. Mm. Mm. So we have to deal with that. Mm -hmm. We can't impose on the text this oneness because that's comfortable. Right. We have to start to understand who is God as he reveals himself to us. And mm -hmm. that's what we have to deal with. And with anything, it's about understanding what the author of the scripture is telling us, not what we'd like it to be. Right. Yeah. So one of my favorite places in Tanakh where God is stretches our traditional Jewish understanding of his incorporeality uh, is from Genesis chapter 18, uh, which begins with, and the Lord appeared to him. It's uh, the beginning of Vayira, Parshat Vayira. It says, and the Lord, and that there is the Tetragrammaton, appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the door of his tent. And so it goes from saying the Lord himself appeared to him, saying he saw three men, the word man is used, approaching. He feeds them, these three men, a meal, so they have bodies, they have flesh, and are able to consume food. And then they are referred to also as angels. And two of them, there are three at the beginning, two of them apparently are sent off uh, to rescue Lot from Sodom one of them remains and the text goes on and it says then the men set out from there and they looked down toward sodom and abraham went with them to set them on their way the lord said again the tetragrammaton adonai the lord said shall i hide from abraham what i am about to do seeing that abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him for i have chosen him that he may uh command his children and it goes on but the whole idea there is that the text reveals a scene in which Avraham right is talking to Adonai face to face and the only person that this could be is the third one of the men who are also described as angels and so it puts God into a, a corporal identifiable existence in a way that does not fit uh, traditional yeah, and rabbinic even, theology. Even uh, in the Garden of Eden, right? God walks with Adam in the cool of the day. Right. So, you know, you have to wrestle with in what form is God taking a walk with the man he created? To right. come back to that, just to, to, see, to see it even more clearly. So we see the one that is here on earth mm -hmm. uh, and he's speaking to God and clearly that's the case. And in verse 24, of Genesis 19, it says this, because they, as they went into, into uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, it says, then the Lord, that's the Tetragrammaton, rained on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone fire from the Lord, again, Tetragrammaton, out of heaven. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. Now we've got two lords, two tetragrammatons in the same verse, one's in heaven and one's on earth. Right. <laughs> right. We have to deal with this. We can't be like skipping around, imposing on the text that God is Yahid one, when here it is clearly that there's two of them, right. one here and one there. Yeah, and just to raise the question, is it possible that there's more to it than you've been told? I think this is the critical fact. At the end of the day, many Jewish people will say, fine, Jesus is the Messiah, I've got no problem with that. The issue is when we say that he's God, mm -hmm. right? Like that, right. the deity of Messiah is, the, is really the key issue, mm -hmm. okay? And this is why in Daniel chapter 7 is such an important thing because we know from the scriptures that God says he will not share his glory with anyone. Mm -hmm. So we agree with that. Yet in Daniel 7, there is one who is like a man, bar enosh, which means one who is frail. Mm -hmm. It God shares his glory with him, gives him all authority. So what do we do with that? Mm -hmm. it's, it's critically important to understand that really it's God the Son. Mm -hmm. In fact, that order of things clarifies much better than the Son of God. It is God the Son. Mm -hmm. And it is that triunity where we have the relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, which we clearly see as an individual person throughout the Scriptures, which is the God that we serve. One is far greater and far more complex than, than we even begin to understand. Yeah, and it's oftentimes claimed man cannot become God. That's one of the main objections is you Christians worship a man, and that is idolatry. And we Jewish people will never do that. So what's the response to man can never become God? Yeah, it didn't happen that way. God became man, right? The Word became flesh. It was the incarnation. It was the divine taking on a human body, which is different than a man working himself up somehow to be elevated to Godhood. That's not how it happened. And I think that's what a lot of the Jewish community has been told, is that somehow this regular man was born who professed himself to be God in the flesh, and now a bunch of Christians follow him. And maybe Jesus started off as a good Jewish boy, but then he went Meshuggana and claimed himself as God in the flesh. But as you mentioned, I think the narrative of the scriptures and, and really the story that the Jewish people have told is that God so loved the world that he became man, which as we can see clearly in some of the examples from the Tanakh, it's not beyond God to do that. He walked in the garden. He walked with Abraham. He takes on different forms. God can do anything he wants. Mm -hmm. The other yeah, objection man. that often comes up is they say, well, the scripture says that God is not a man, but that is a soundbite. It is God is not a man that he should lie. Yeah. It's describing the character of God in relation to man. It's not saying that he cannot be man. Very important mm -hmm. when that, uh, that accusation comes up. Secondly, we see in, in, in uh, Exodus chapter 15, verse three, it says, the Lord, Tetragrammaton, is a warrior. And the word in the Hebrew there means man. We can't be picking and choosing. What we'd like to be is consistent. That's all we're saying. And here's the benefit that we have. We have the scriptures in our own language today. And if you can read Hebrew even better, but for Jewish people, we have our scriptures for ourselves to read. We don't have to be told this is what it means. Right. Today, there is no reason why we shouldn't be able to go to the text, read it for ourselves, mm -hmm. and let God speak. Right. Yes, that's an excellent point. And to say to someone who is seeking for truth, to say, read for yourself, right? I can tell you what I think it means. That's my opinion. But before you read the text, why don't you ask God to confirm to you what the truth is? of it is. Mm -hmm. It's one of the benefits that we have. It's like, I won't believe it until it's in writing. This is why we have contracts, because what I said and what you said changes over time. But because in God, in his providence, put it in writing so that we would have it. He's preserved it. Mm -hmm. This is what I said. You can argue all you like, but this is what I've said. Yeah, and I'll just uh, conclude our conversation with Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4, which says, who's gone up to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind in his hands? Who has bound up the waters in a cloak? Who has established all the ends of the earth? And of course, these are rhetorical questions, and the answer to each one is God Almighty has done these things. Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name, and what is the name of his son, if you know? 